Great. Well, I think if everyone's settled and we're ready to go, I think let's start. Firstly, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Um, today, our open lecture is in conversation with Putney volunteers. It's facilitated by our own Emma Cartwright, who coordinates our volunteers here at the RHN. Um, if you have any questions for us, if you could um, type them through to the Q&A box, it should be at the bottom of your screen or to the right hand side. They will come through to me and I will put them to the panelists at the end of the open lecture. Um, so first things first, let's hand over to you, Emma. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, welcome everybody. I'm the volunteer coordinator here at the Royal Hospital for Neurodisability. I started exactly a year ago. Um, and my first four month, five months were kind of finding out about what the volunteering it looked like when I came and looking at ways of developing it and then oh COVID happened so we had to lock down and volunteering stopped and volunteering stopped for six months um, because we, we we locked down all our wards and people we were minim, minim, minimizing the number of people who could come onto um, the, the, into the hospital um, so I was working on the COVID response team so not working in volunteering um, I from September we have been looking at ways in which we can cautiously and very cautiously bring back our, our volunteers um, and it'll be it'll look different from how it was before. Um, um, I've, I've got four panelists here so I've got three volunteers one of whom's been a volunteer since 2015 so he's Michael Smith, um, Mike Smith will be able to tell us about his experiences before Covid, during Covid and now that it's a little less tight and, and locked down um, post-COVID, well, it's not post-COVID, we're still in COVID. Um, I've also got a, um, a volunteer who was recruited during um, lockdown, um, and that is um, Darren Markham, who is volunteering on our shuttle bus service, which is a service um, run to help our staff get from the hospital to Clapham Junction, because with buses only having so many people um, able to go on them, we needed to um, help our staff, um, our wonderful staff, to, to get um, back to Clapham Junction in, in a orderly manner. Um, and then I've also got um, Michael Davies, who is a new volunteer um, who has um, come and done the uh, COVID risk assessment. So he hasn't started yet. So he's going to be able to give us the, the view on why he um, was interested in volunteering here, what he's hoping to gain from his experience. And um, also what the process has been like, because it, there is quite a process to go through, as you can imagine. And then I also have, um, I, my coup is having um, Monet. Now, um, Monet is our infection control guru here at the hospital, and she has been front and centre of um, our COVID response team and looking at ways in which we can safely um, manage anybody being in, on the, in, in the building. So I've been working closely with her and looking at ways in which we can bring volunteers back into the hospital. Um, so we... Here at the hospital, for those of you who don't know, we have about 230 patients and residents. Um, our patients are about 60 patients, and they are people who come in because they have um, maybe had a road traffic accident, have had a stroke, and they've had um, acquired brain injury. And they come to us for about three to four months for um, rehabilitation. And so they will be with us for a brief period of time, the view being that hopefully they can go home. Um, that's, the, that's the best case scenario. So after all the rehabilitation, they're able to go home. Some people are not able to go home. They have to go to a, a, a step down facility because um, we are top of the trees here um, in terms of neuro rehabilitation. So um, if, if they don't need everything that we can give here, they will go to a step down facility. But then for some people, um, they need to stay here um, after three, four months. Their, their progress hasn't been such that they're able to go anywhere else. And then at that point, they'll become a resident. And so we have about 180 people who are residents here. And though for them, this is their home. And that is why we need volunteers, because 98% of our residents and um, people here are um, in wheelchairs. And so in order for them to get around or do anything, they need someone to push them. And in order for that to happen and for social interaction to happen, we need volunteers. That is how it used to be, um, because we used to do things off the wards. We used to do um, botcher, which is a, 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 like bowls in wheelchairs, and we used to do music making. We had chapel services. All that's not happening at the moment, because we are having to be very, very aware of keeping things limited to the ward. 
So all our volunteering going forward is going to be ward based so that we can help track and trace people and uh, people are limiting their exposure um, to, to our wards um, and our residents. So um, I, we're trying to be proportionate about it with our, with our volunteering, looking at what is, what is feasible what is workable, what is we have capacity for, because it's not just capacity of volunteers, how many volunteers we've got, because I know, I know a lot of people are just desperate to get back to volunteering um, here, but it's a question of can the staff on the wards support that volunteering and doing that, do that in a meaningful way. So we are not, I'm bringing back people very cautiously and very slowly. There are also quite a lot of hoops, which I know Michael will talk to you about um, to, to run through in terms of risk assessment. Um, in, in order to come back. So we're doing ward-based, which is a lot, a lot of that's to do with befriending, one-to-one, -one, identify people, because they're quite lonely on the wards at the moment, because, you know, whereas before visitors could come in every day um, and visit their family members, they're now allowed to come once a month for an hour and a half. Now that's very difficult, very difficult for the family members um, not to be able to come and see their, their, their um, loved ones here. That's also actually why we've got to be very careful in terms of getting lots of volunteers back here because how, how will our, our family members feel to, if they see other people coming in? And that is an all part and parcel of proportionality. Um, and the fact is that our volunteers will be um, accountable. They will be very carefully managed and they will have a volunteer placement supervisor on the ward who will be very much supporting their volunteering um, during during this time so it is it is a question of slowly slowly which i know can be very frustrating for people but we're doing it we're doing it in, in, in that way I, I, keep, I keep looking over here because i'm looking at, at monet who's who's been part and parcel of making that looking at the strategy for it um, so i with, with the one-to-one -one befriending there's also um, staying connected which is helping them to connect to their family members through iPads and through things like Zoom um, and, and whereas during lockdown the ward staff were doing that this by having volunteers that will free up the ward staff to do their um, clinical based support so that we've got wonderful volunteers who can help with the um, communicating with, with relatives. Um, Again, for those of you who don't know the RHN, um, we have people from people who have complete understanding and capacity to people who are PDOC, which is um, profound disorder of consciousness. So are not able to communicate in, in any meaningful way and, and, and that you, you don't get very many visual clues. But we treat everybody as though they can hear everything and understand everything that we're saying. So that is really important um, with that. And, and for their family members, it's lovely if we can help them to communicate back to their family members. Um, so um, I'm going to now um, hand over, I think, to, to, to the panelists. I'm going to start um, by introducing um, Mike Smith, who, has, as I said, has been a um, volunteer here since 2015. And Mike has been working throughout the time here. Um, and so he's going to give us a bit of a, a, a feel for what it's been like for him. Thank you, Mike. Okay, th thanks, Emma, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of what I did since 2015, the way it was, in other words, um, what we did uh, for volunteering activities during lockdown, which was a challenge, and then the return to RHN. As I say, I started in 2015, uh, excuse me, <coughs> Broken the throat there. Um, I was esc escorting uh, patients to things like the film club, to church, uh, to a documentary group. Um, also, um, I was working in the uh, computer room known as Compass, uh, using the, uh, the adaptive uh, technology that they've got. Also, one to one patient support, reading to them, etc. Um, also, I'm a patient and family representative for uh, Devonshire Ward. I'm sure we'll talk about that, that, that sort of thing a little later on. Um, other activities, um, well, I was working with Monet or supporting Monet with um, um, audits, uh, uh, infection control audits, um, food and the like. Um, also um, assisted in the, uh, the University Freshers Week recruitment fair a couple of years ago. Um, 
as I say, there, 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 there were various things that I, I, I launched off with, um, with the film group, but then gradually expanded my role uh, to involve all these other things. And there are other things, but I, we haven't got too, too much time to talk about that. Um, but as Emma said, then COVID came along uh, from the very early days, because I worked very closely with Jeff uh, Coy, now chaplain, uh, from the very early days uh, of, uh, of, of lockdown, I think probably back in March, uh, we worked with on Zoom um, to, to work with uh, some patients on Chat, Chatsworth with tablets uh, to have a quiz. It was just one or two patients at a time uh, because the nurses were obviously uh, busy with the additional work they had to do uh, with managing COVID. But they were really great in setting up the tablets with one or two uh, of the residents so we could at least have a quiz once a week. Um, once Jeff was allowed back into the hospital, he could conduct a, uh, a chapel service, um, which was on Chatsworth Ward. It was going to be ward-based, and I guess that'll be talked to a little later on. Everything is ward-based now in the volunteering role, or currently. Um, so he was there doing the, uh, the, uh, the, the church service and the quiz on a Thursday. Um, I was up there on the big screen. They plugged me into the big screen in the, um, the day room there. And also I assisted him by doing the church reading. Um, return to RHN was what? Last, I think it was the last month, wasn't it? No, it was in August. Um, went through a COVID assessment with, um, with Emma. Um, and I started back on Chatsworth Ward with Jeff and the, um, uh, the, the Thursday church service and also the Sunday uh, service. Um, also started back in the computer room, which is treated as a, what you might call it, a virtual ward. Um, and currently now, now that we are zoned again, uh, we have people just coming into that room from, from particular zones on a, a particular day. Um, what has really struck me throughout all of this is the, what you might call the resilience of the patients, the residents, that they, um, you know, some of them have got a fair, their cognition is quite good, some not so good, but where, where, I, where, where we could recognize the cognition, they were really taking it on board and what we were doing and, uh, and engaging with it. So I, I was really impressed with the resilience of the, uh, I suppose resilience is the right word, I don't know, of the patients. Uh, it was really good. And the scrubs that I was wearing, um, they're quite colorful, the new scrubs. And uh, they, re they really do enjoy all the colours, especially when you get really bright pinks. And I'm wearing bright pinks in the ward. And uh, they really enjoyed it. And they do comment on it. They say it's really nice to see these, these colourful scrubs. Um, so that is great. I, I don't mind what I look like. As long as they fit, I don't care what I look like. The patients are really happy with it. And it's good. It, it's nice to see uh, the patients smiling. Um, I think that's probably my five minutes. I'll stop there. I'm sure we're, we'll revisit some of these items as we go along. Thank you, Michael. And, and, and I would also say resilience, when you mentioned resilience, it's also the resilience of the staff as well. Yeah. The volunteers are really going to be key in supporting the staff to do their work. So the occupational therapists, the, the physiotherapists, the speech and language therapists, and the resilience of them, um, one of the, the ward Chatsworth that you've mentioned is where I'm going to. I'm starting with a model for for the, this new volunteering, and um, Brenda, who was an, uh, the occupational therapist, she's she's the associated healthcare professional who I'm liaising with on that ward. I mean, during COVID, she just put her shoulder to the wheel and did anything that was needed, um, and then so so she's now leading on that. So she would be the, the key link on that ward but resilience is a really good word thank you yeah and i do yeah I, I fully support the staff have been really great really great especially in lockdown you know going around setting up those tablets um because that that was over and above it really was and it wasn't easy no and, and I, I, also i'd say at the moment i've got four volunteers back so it is very slowly um just making sure everyone's comfortable getting reviews on on how that's going but i'm hoping to bring more back on a, on a uh, you know, individual basis. So just so that people know that that's where we're at at the moment. Okay, well, I'm now going to introduce you to Darren. Darren um, came to us through the Richmond Council for Voluntary Services. They put out a call, a call to arms back in April um, for people to 
drive a shuttle bus service, which would enable our staff to get at the end of the day to get from here to um, Batten Junction. Um, because at that time, buses were few and far between. And then I'm probably saying things that Darren's going to say, but then but buses um, now are very full. Um, and also, one of the feedbacks I've had when I've driven the bus is that sometimes when they see that you're wearing a, um, a hospital lanyard, the bus drivers don't want you on because they think that you're going to be, you know, COVID, um, you know, danger, rather than actually being incredibly, you know, COVID safe. So, um, but Darren um, was, was one of the people who answered the advert um, in, with the Richmond Council of Voluntary Services and joined us in April, May time. So over to you, Darren, if you could tell us about how it's been for you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Emma. Hello, everybody. Um, so, yeah, yeah, decided to do some local volunteering with whatever really I could do because of the kind of the void that was left for many of us in uh, COVID turning up. Um, historically, I do a lot of charity work locally, uh, nationally and internationally, um, working along with uh, uh, KHT, which is the charitable arm of the Jehovah's Witnesses. So I'm involved in sort of local projects, building projects, um, charity work, all volunteer based. Well, that all stopped um, three weeks before the lockdown started in Italy globally the Jehovah's Witnesses stopped all projects because they could see what was going to happen so they stopped everything well before so at that point we were told that we can't obviously be involved in stuff where we got interaction with people and just look at things just on a local level so I thought well what can I do so I applied to a number of different councils and local areas and um, and Emma uh, wanted someone that could drive a minibus with some sort of qualifications, which proved to be quite interesting because we kind of had them and kind of didn't have them, didn't we? But we got there in the end. <laughs> and uh, I've been doing that, yeah, since since June. Yeah, it's been good. It's been it's been nice to sort of start to get to know the nurses, some of the security guys as well. Um, help just knowing that you're helping someone it doesn't really matter to me how I'm helping someone knowing that you're helping them to do something or you're part of a <clears throat> cog in a chain where there's a need is what's important really, isn't it? So um, whoever it is, however it is. And, you know, my, my observation is that these, these ones at the hospital uh, work extremely hard under very, difficult conditions um and often let's be brutally honest in this current climate are often looked down upon uh because of their different backgrounds which is wrong but that's another discussion isn't it so anything i could do to help uh is good and get a bit of a rapport with uh, some of them and i spoke some pidgin english with a few of them and a little bit of twee and a little bit of nigerian and had a little bit of a giggle so that's been quite good so uh, yeah, that's basically what I've been doing and still doing it until Emma says the time is nigh. That's it really. Thank you, Darren, thank you. And actually uh, the, the feedback we have from the staff, so it's the domestic staff, it's the nursing staff, it, it's, it's security, it, it, they, they've all said, you know, how much it's, it, it's meant to them. And I think for their well-being, at the end of a shift, it is nice to know that they are going to be able to get to Clapham Junction without too much difficulty. I think, Darren, you would agree, though, that the uh, the roads have changed since since April May time. They were empty back then, and now it's it's a bit stop start. Yeah, they've gone. It's where everything's gone from being like you know, being in a movie, wasn't it? It was blissful in a weird sort of not nice way, but great. Um, it took, I, I think. Well, I think the quickest journey was about five minutes four minutes 50 and now it's back up to 15 minutes because i'm, I'm surprised surprised we didn't get a pcn for that then that no nah, well as long as you slow down the speaker no i'm only joking um <laughs> it has meant an awful lot to, to the staff and that's you know so, so volunteering is yes it's about our, our patients um and on the wards and, and patient and resident facing 
but it is also about supporting supporting the staff. Yeah. And this has been a, a piece of work that's, that's that, you know, it's running definitely until the end of October, and we're hoping that's going to go to go on a, a bit a bit further. So that's great. So I and I do need to recruit. If it's going to go on, I do need to recruit some more people to join the likes of Darren, and um, I've got about six or seven others um, in order to to ensure that that can continue. But it, it is definitely something that's that's been. Um, uh, you know, appreciated and, and also it's something that's been able to be run because it's outside the hospital um, so it's there is a security to that and that was all risk assessed as well um, so that's all been all been looked at everyone's got their canal wipes to clean all the surfaces as they join the, the, the bus on their shift so thank you Darren thank you for, for, for that I'm now going to um, introduce you um, our, our, um, Michael Davies to, to join us um, Michael um, it has um, applied to, to, to become a volunteer um, and he applied subsequent to COVID um, and while I am not generally starting new volunteers, um, certain volunteers have certain um, particular skill sets um, that are of you know, um, a benefit for, for us. Now Michael's got a background in uh, massage and um, yoga therapies so we're possibly on the wards once he's, he's had his induction on the ward um, he would might well work with one of the occupational therapists um, physiotherapists to help with th that particular side of things um, so um, he hasn't started yet he starts next week um, and so I'm going to hand over to, to Michael for him to say what he's um, hoping to, to gain from it and and how all the hoops he had to jump through in order to get to this stage Thank you, Michael. Great, thank you very much, Emma. So my, my personal reason as to why I was interested in helping and volunteering, I grew up with my aunt who acquired a brain injury by meningitis, and I saw her journey from having, you know, being mobile and being able to use both of her arms to being losing the function of her right hand to the dominant hand and both of her legs, and seeing her journey and progressing and really being able to learn and acquire new information, and it was very very moving and still want to be able to help and assist in any way i can now professionally one of, i have different professions one of which is i'm a massage therapist and another is i'm a tax consultant and a few months ago i was able to do a research and develop a tax credit claim for a occupational therapy a clinic that focused on neurological rehabilitation and was able to understand and they're doing pioneering work to get um, different ways in which to assess and monitor and help patients with acquired brain injury or congenital or by any means. And it's started to interest me that I know I want to study further and to do my master's and potentially PhD in neuroscience. And I was recommended the Royal Hospital of Neurodisability by the owner of that company, Ms. Jo Throp. And she only had wonderful things to say about the facility. And I reached out to Emma and Emma just was so forthcoming as to just the state of where we were in the midst of COVID and what needs to be done in order to do this successfully. We stayed in touch and last week she invited me in and we went through the induction not in the ward. And I was just struck by the professionalism, the, the depth at which the, the plan and the induction was rolled out related to COVID, how best to protect not just the patients and to interact with them, but also as a more complete mechanism to wonder and to look after the state of mind and well-being of the staff, which is crucial that these people who are giving so much of their time and energy to support and to grow with the patients, um, they also need to be supported in this time. So for my own experience, I just looking forward, I'm just looking forward to learn and just to be of, of use in any way, shape or form. And yeah, I'm really looking forward to being a part of the team. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so we have the, as well as the COVID risk assessment, which we have to fill out online. Um, there's also um, we have to go through the induction, um, uh, which has changed slightly. Um, and the risk assessment is all about well, the risk assessment that we do here is 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 the staff risk assessment. So it's about um, the risk of being here in the hospital. But from my point of view, and for um, thinking about volunteers, I'm also looking at inbound risk. 
so the risk that volunteers might bring into the hospital so um at the moment we have for example we've got no students um coming in um if, if they're postgraduate that's slightly different if if their social situation is such that they are not seeing a lot of people but if you're at school at the moment we're not having any students from schools in because the risk is too high um, and then we also have to think about the risk of some of our volunteers on an age basis. You know, uh, should should we should we cocoon them? Should we care? You know, we've got a duty of care to to some of our volunteers as well. Um, so here's me talking about risk um, from from volunteering. But I'm going to pass you over to somebody who is much better at talking about risk. I'm going to pass you over to Monet. Now I've got to walk past her. I've got to put this on. So over to Monet. Thank you. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Monette, and I'm the infection control nurse at the Royal Hospital for New Disability. Um, well, we, we talk about COVID every day from when it came to the UK isn't it, in January, and the conversations we had from January to February is, will it come to RHN? Hopefully not, but if it comes to RHN, what are we going to do? What happened is it, it came to RHN, even though we put our um, precautions in place three weeks ahead of everyone in the UK, we still got it and it still affected at least 20% of our patients and probably 10-15% of our staff. So it's a difficult time. It was a very difficult time for everyone, most especially our patients, but um, our staff as well had suffered emotionally and mentally. And we recognize that at those times when we locked our doors to visitors, to volunteers, we felt how big the impact is of our volunteers. You are integral part in the delivery of service. So, now that we're looking forward, getting past the pandemic, we, we would like to make our service as practicable and um, safe as possible. So with our COVID management plan moving forward, aligned with the business as usual, we recognize that volunteers as integral part of our service can be integrated. A lot of the healthcare organizations um, have their own definition of front lines frontliners, and most of them define them as the doctors, the nurses, the HCAs, AHPs, you know, the physio and OT. In this hospital, our frontliners extends to porters, domestic staff, volunteers. So we include everyone and anyone who has close interaction to our patients. And that's why moving forward, we need to make sure that you are included in our risk assessment. Um, so I'll probably start by saying, what is our business as usual? Because our business as usual is 75% of our patient requires help from you. And Emma has already said that in the beginning. So how can we do that and continue that safely? Bear in mind that what we know about COVID now is not different from what we knew on February. So it's a respiratory disease and it's transmitted by uh, respiratory droplets. So meaning coughing, sneezing, and although everyone can be exposed to COVID-19, not everyone will have the same symptoms. So knowing those guiding principles, it would be enough for us to, so to stick with the basic. Because if we know how COVID can enter our body or our patient's body, we can put measures to stop it or stop the transmission. So we'll, we're looking at how does it enter our body if it's through respiratory symptoms. So inhalation, okay? So somebody can cough it out or sneeze it out and other people will breathe them in. With that in mind, we can cover our face through face mask and face covering. Um, and it's easy for us to put that on, but not all of our patients are able to. So they rely on us to put that barrier between them and us. 
Um, what else do we know about COVID? That when somebody sneezes or cough, they can spray in the surroundings or equipment around them. So we need to make sure that we are cleaning our environment regularly. And always remember that our hands can touch the surfaces so they can be contaminated at all times. That's when hand hygiene becomes very important. Yes, it's very basic and it's very easy, but it's important that you know when to wash your hands. Because when those hands, when those contaminated hands touch a patient, a vulnerable patient, the risk is very high. What else? We know scientifically that sneeze and cough travels a meter from the source. So that's why, that's, what, what, that's where your two meter social distancing come from. So that's a meter from me and a meter from you. So that's where your social distancing come from. Our patients, majority of them, I think 99% of them are on wheelchair. So we can actually provide that space in between patients. But for us, who will be looking after them, helping them out, that would be almost impossible because how can we move their wheelchair if we're two meters away from them? But combining all those measures, so hand washing, wearing a face mask, maintaining that distance where we can, they're a very good combination in making sure that COVID doesn't transfer from one person to another. We have the opportunity and capability in RHN at the moment to enhance those measures. So we are screening our patients routinely and um, we have now included our staff. And in this plan, we can include our volunteers as well when they're on site. So routine screening includes when somebody's symptomatic, you just have to inform Emma and we can create a ticket for you. We'll do a clinical assessment. If his screening is indicated, we will screen you. If you are in a, in a ward where we're doing weekly screening, we will screen you as well because we would like to take a snapshot of at a certain period of time when everyone seems well, are there any people who are carrying it and test positive without any symptom? So we can then further advise our infection control measures. We have started zoning last week. So zoning is well, it's a soft zoning. It's not like what we did during the lockdown. It is putting people in a bubble. So when we have a positive case, it's easier to contact trace people. Because if, imagine if we have a volunteer who goes into 12 wards, and if our volunteer became symptomatic and tests positive, then that would be 12 wards of contact tracing, testing patients, testing staff. Well, if we allocate you in two wards or one ward, one ward, I was told one ward. <laughs> <laughs> so then that's the group of patient and group of staff that would be contact trace. So it's easier to contain it. Um, what else do we do? You've already mentioned the assessment. So when you come here, there's a checklist, a series of questions just asking you, have you traveled recently? Do you have symptoms? Are you able to wear masks? And are there any things that you need to let us know? You don't have to tell us where you went. You just have to tell us, is it on the travel corridors or is it from a country that requires quarantine coming back to the country? Okay, so I think I've <laughs> said a little bit of snapshot of IPC and I would like to finish it up by saying infection control measures works well we have seen um, the positive outcome of our actions because our last case was April 17. And we have symptomatic patients, we have symptomatic staff, we screen them. And as of today, we haven't had any case. Um, a very good example of infection control measures working its wonders is that during the pandemic, we had asymptomatic staff. And when we test them on the routine testing, they came out positive and they have been working with our patients for weeks. But the, the patients they were looking after never tested positive in the routine testing. So it means it shows that mask 
hand hygiene, social distancing, looking after themselves, staying hydrated, very simple, but it works, um, really works. And they have to be in combination. We can't choose that today I'm going to be washing my hands and forget about social distancing. Actually, to close it off, our plan now is to look up look at our weak points. And at the moment, our weak point is not when we are around patient, because when we're around patient, our mindset is to protect them. So we're always washing our hands, we're always wearing our mask. But when we're around our social circle, our colleague, we forget. So we tend to have coffee with them, we have breaks with them, and we remove our mask and just forget about COVID. So that's where we need to probably channel all our effort in providing spaces where people can safely catch up and socially distance, talk and eat without their mask. But because we provided that space for them, we make it safe. And I think that's it for me. Thank you. I'm going to get my mask. <laughs> I'm going to walk past you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Monet. I think that was really helpful. Um, you know, you can see how blessed we are to have, have Monet on our, on our team because she's just, uh, as I say, Monet is on it. Um, so, sorry, Monet. Um, one thing I would just say, when, when, when I said to her, she said one ward, so I just dropped my note. When I said to her one ward, um, I just went, wow. um, it can be two wards, but that has to be on t for volunteering, but that would have to be on a different shift. So um, if you were befriending somebody on a particular ward, um, you, um, you can do that and you can befriend somebody on another ward, but you couldn't do that on the same shift. Um, and as, as Monet said, there were the, the three things that, uh, it's, it's not the NHS, it's the MHS. It's mask, hand washing and space. With volunteers, it's also scrubs. So I think um, Mike Smith um, told, told us about um, his, his jazzy scrubs. There are some very jazzy scrubs knocking around here, I tell you. If you're face to face with patients, you take your, your outside clothes off um, and you, you put scrubs on and that's a way of doing it. So that's, that's also quite a, a layer of complexity to, to, to get that all sorted because you can only wear the scrubs for, for one shift, um, but they're very jazzy. Um, so that is basically um, where we're at with volunteering at the moment, which is very, very slow start, baby steps, basically, back into volunteering. Um, and we're not going to get everybody back in because that's a numbers game that, that raises um, the, the, you know, the risk. So um, it, it's, it's ones that we can manage and we can work out, you know, we know who's, who's who and who's where. Um, for, for track and tracing when we, we've done amazingly well i am just in awe of you know well emily who was my line manager who's now left us but she was in charge of the COVID team and monet um, um and jeff you know everybody that that's one thing that really has come out in in those six months is the teamwork so just just anybody's considering um please do apply it might be that it now is not the time that we're, we're going to be recruiting new people um, but do 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 apply and um, we can have that conversation um, if you are current um, volunteers I'm going to be getting back in touch with you on a one-to-one -one basis um, I, I'm going through the list of people who've responded to say they want to come back um, but we've, we've just got to do it we've got to do it cautiously and um, capacity of the staff to manage it um, and um, capacity of the hospital to deal with new people on the wards, more, more people, because more people, more risk. Um, but I do want to say volunteers, I think Monet, it was really nice to hear from Monet that, you know, how much the volunteers have been missed and how much they do contribute to, to the whole in this place. Um, it, they, they, they really are part and parcel of kind of the warp and weft of this place. So thank you to everybody on that. So now I'm going to, um, I'm looking at, I'm looking at on my screen at, at Anna, um, who yes. I think will, is, is scribbling down questions that people have, have come questions. up with. I have, yes. So if we move on to the Q&A, thank you. Um, I've got a few questions. So if anyone else wants to send questions via the Q&A button at the bottom, please do. Um, but just to start off with, obviously you touched on that you're not going to have all the volunteers come back immediately. Um, do you have any opportunities for remote volunteering? Now this is interesting because 
I was thinking, well, this whole staying connected, that would be lovely. You, you could become a buddy, you know, befriend somebody through the staying connected. However, that doesn't actually work because then we'd still need a healthcare assistant or somebody to be pulled off their clinical work in order to set up that connection. So it, you're between, between a rock and a hard place on that. Um, yes, I do need more um, volunteer um, shuttle bus drivers. That's, that's one way for, for a remote. There's also remote um, volunteering. Um, Chris Olver, who is our um, archivist here at the hospital is doing a project um, an archive project and that can be done remotely so I'm going to be emailing out my current volunteers um, to say if anybody has got um, uh, can praise the inf information is, is good at um, editing skills editorial skills that can be done remotely um, one thing that I was thinking would be quite nice to do would be for some of my previous volunteers you know to, to be mentors to incoming volunteers so you can have a buddy who you can say oh I've, i found this how does that work i don't want to, i don't want to um you know keep bothering the the, the the nursing staff but what what should i do so that is something that i'm going to look to do so i'm going to test that out with my current volunteers to see who would be happy to be a mentor um and that's uh, for, for an incoming volunteer or on, on the ward um but it is difficult is, is, is in, in terms of um, remote stuff, yeah. it's the practicality here as well. Okay, well, thank you. Um, so I've got another question um, from someone who's never worked with uh, brain injury, people with brain injury, an environment with people with brain injury before. If they volunteer, do you have a sort of an induction programme? Oh yes, oh yes. Now, uh, Michael Davies has, is, is, is the most recent um, person who's had to go through that. It is quite in depth. I mean, we, we do, we have, protocols we have um, all sorts of things that you would do within, within the induction things like health and safety safeguarding because that's really really key for um, our residents because they are very vulnerable um, we also have um, how to communicate with our, our patients and residents because some of them can com communicate and some some cannot and we have what's called a passport on the back of uh, everybody's um, wheelchair mm -hmm. and that gives you the information and it might well say I'm not able to communicate please make decisions in my best interest. Um, or please, it might, might say, um, I, I'm not able to communicate, but please ask me simple, or, or if you, they can communicate, sorry, but you know, ask me simple yes, no questions um, and wait, wait. For, and again, you will not be thrown onto the board on your own. You will have, a, you, you'd have an induction, you'd have, you'd have the, the, the generic induction with me, about volunteering here and covering all the bases. And then you'd have a ward induction with your, um, 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 volunteer supervisor who would go through things and they would be your go-to person it might be a speech and language how to communicate so no they're, they're, it's, it, there's, it's an awful lot to learn an awful lot to learn um, um, but uh, and again that's why we can't bring in a whole load of new people because it's, it's there's a time issue to that in order to do it properly mm. No, it's understandable. Um, we've got a great question here. Um, is there anything that the RHN can do for its volunteers, i.e. COVID swabbing, NHS IDs, discounts? Well, we, we do, as I think Monet was saying, we do, we do do the screening. So there, that, is, that is absolutely available. And in fact, we also volunteers are in, entitled to have the um, flu jab, which I had yesterday. <laughs> I'm fine. Um, so that was a, a very efficient. Um, so we, we, we do do that. Um, we, are, we are looking to do things like um, possibly to, to have some yoga sessions for our staff. So we've got a lovely big, um, the, the assembly room is a huge room where we could be socially distanced so we could do yoga. Just thinking of the well-being of our staff. And also, it's a kind of, it is a social, social, but socially distanced. I'm looking at one. I promise you, um, ways in which we can we can do that to to to, to recognise the need for, for for our staff to to to, to do that. Um, so that, that is something that I'm I'm going to see if I can find a volunteer who would come in and do do that for us. Um, uh, and yeah, I think I think I think that's more or less answers the question. Okay, thank you. Um, next question. Uh, it's from someone who can only potentially do weekend. Is that okay? Do you have to volunteer through the whole week or can you do sporadically? Well, the thing is at the moment, because at the moment I've got, a, I've got 170 volunteers on the books 
um, and which who at the moment are into, I, I've been I've been doing a huge piece of work in in you know those who've said they want to be active, those who are on sabbatical. So basically, all my students are on sabbatical because they're students. Um, those who are on sabbatical because they're cocooning, and then those who are on sabbatical for circumstantial reasons. You know, they might be looking after somebody who's 92 and don't want to expose themselves. They're on sabbatical, they want to come back, but th at the moment they're, they're not. Um, then I've had, got people who've gone quiet, um, or people who've said, actually, no, that's it now, I, I, I don't want to volunteer anymore. As well as those 170, I've also got, I've got over 150 people who have wanted to volunteer. I can't bring everybody in um, to, to, to volunteer. Um, Saturday working is, is more problematical, if I'm honest, because um, at the moment I'm using Chatsworth as, as my model and Brenda, who is the person, the go-to person, is Monday to Friday. Um, it's not to say it's not doable. I've got a, another colleague, um, Amanda, who I'm, I'm going to be speaking to because she does Saturday um, and, and, and very likely that she would be able to um, manage that and, and, and lead that, that element of it. So it is worth it is worth asking, but everything's going to be kind of titrated through through the you know the, the need the need and proportionality and capacity. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so obviously it's it's slightly difficult at the moment because we're all working remotely or we can't come into the hospital like you say. But in a normal world, what kind of skills do you look for? in your volunteers? Empathy. That's the most important thing, I think, is, is empathy and understanding. Um, as you can probably tell, I can talk the hind leg off a donkey. And I went on the training course for communicating with our, our residents. And there's one particular resident who has come with me to recruit people from uh, schools. So, um, uh, um, parents um, who you know, drop their little darlings off at school and then have the day free and so we're wanting to recruit so I went with this particular resident um, and I've been the week before on a um, the training on communicating because that, that's some of our training is also available to, to volunteers as well and we're looking at so it, that goes back to another question in terms of well-being um, is, is actually thinking we, we value you and if you can learn more skills. Anyway, I've been on this communicating one and, and I was in the back of the um, ambulance, the transport, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. going to this school. And so I, I knew that this volunteer came from Ireland and my nephews are in Ireland. So I said, um, so which part of Ireland are you from? Kildare, she said. Now, it, it actually does work quite well on Zoom because um, a lot of times when I say tell that story in in um, and it's not a story it's a real, real thing um, I, I jump in I jump in the whole time but I didn't I didn't I let her say Kildare so she came up with the Kildare and it, that that was something I re that, that really is important it's it's to be able to listen um, it's to have that empathy um, and a huge dose of reality as well in terms of what their their life is like um and the difference that it can make by having a volunteer um, to help with social interaction and social isolation um so that that's what i would say uh, the other thing for for me if i'm honest is to have somebody who can commit so once a week is great because then we know exactly where we are once a month is fine but if people who say well i can do that i could do that Actually, that's a little bit more tricky because with 170, trying to juggle all of that, if, if, you, can, if you can commit to a regular slot, that, that is worth its weight in gold. Yeah, of course. Um, I've got another question here. How long um, does it take to go through the whole sort of the process? Oh, is Michael still there? Um, we, it wasn't too bad. It was um, yeah, about yeah. three weeks. Yes, I'd say three weeks from start to finish, uh, getting yes. an out EBS, and then yeah, starting on Tuesday. We're just, we're just waiting for, for Michael, we're waiting on the jolly old DBS, and that's quite a clunky process. Um, um, Mike's, um, I'm looking, pointing because he's in, in that, that area in, in my screen, um, and Mike Smith, um, he's, we're redoing or revisiting all the DBSs of our um, current volunteers, which have gone out of date, or they don't actually go out of date, but it is good practice to renew them every three years. So we're, we're doing that, and we, we, it's quite a clunky process, so that can be slow. 
um, but it's about three weeks. Now, anybody who has applied has, has basically got a sorting pattern. The reason Michael jumped through the, the thing was because he spotted my um, message at the bottom of my, my, my email, which, which said, you know, I'm sometimes in it, it's a bit, just, uh, and he just picked up the phone. Um, so we, we picked up the phone and that's, that's, so that, that, was, that was helpful and, and I could just see that there were, there, were, there, were, there were particular skill sets that he had that were going to be, raise him to the top of the, 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 the you know, uh, priority list for, for, for our, our volunteers. So it's about, it's a, it's a they, people have to come in, they have to do the COVID risk assessment. Um, we then set the DBS going. So yes, it's about, it's about three weeks, four weeks. We then also have to find a time for the ward volunteer supervisor to have um, a space, time, time to spend the time to do the ward induction as well. So it's, it'll be, it'll be a, a process, but about three to four weeks. Hmm. All right, thank you. And uh, we've got one question here. It's a second year neuroscience student asking, could, could the volunteering double up a sort of work experience potentially? Can you choose where you're placed? No, um, that's, um, we, don't, we don't do work experience and stuff because, because our staff are so busy doing the, the day job, they can't really, they haven't got the capacity to, to, to do that. So if we are putting somebody on a ward, it is to, to, to answer the question, could you just? And the answer to could you just is, yes, of course, whatever that, that could you just might be. It might be Peace, who's the board administrator on Chatsworth saying, could you just answer the phones because I need to go and do the photocopying? Or actually, could you just do the photocopying and I'll answer the phones? Um, and the answer, the answer needs to be, yeah, sure. Um, um, so it's not necessarily going to be an unintended, well, an unintended or an intended consequence might well be that you do learn about speech and language or you do learn about occupational therapy, um, but that's not, not the be all and end all. And we, I am responding to the, the wards saying, this is the need that we have have you got a volunteer who can respond to that? And then I place the volunteer to there. So they, they need to respond to, to the need on the ward. Um, and yes, there, there will be, there will be a, a consequence that they will, they will get some amazing experience and, and learn a lot from, from the staff. But that's, that, it's not work experience. Of course. Okay, well, thank you. That is all of my questions. I'm all out. I wondered, do any of our volunteers want a final word before we wrap up? Yeah, just, just just to pick on some to pick up on something that Emma said about um, the communication with the patient, and uh, it is yeah, patients do come, patients do go, but we do have a lot of long term residents, and you do get to know them, and getting to know them can be so important um, in terms of their communication, how how they can communicate, and it can be very nuanced sometimes, and uh, that you learn that over time with that patient and, and you, you kind of develop a relationship with them and um, that's good that's good and uh, when when they look forward to seeing you that is really really nice you know they say oh when are you coming in next um you know will i see you next thursday um i really do like that one other thing it's just something i picked up on uh, it was the um patient feedback a couple of years ago um it came in the form and um, very, very important where uh, patients, uh, residents, when they're taken back to their room, you pick them up, you always introduce yourself and say, I'm oh, Mike, or you have to reintroduce yourself each time because it depends on the, 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 uh, the amount of cognition they've got. Um, but you, I do it anyway and say, it's Mike, it's Thursday, it's church and quiz, hope that's okay. And um, yeah, you'll get the nod or whatever the communication is and off you go. When you return the person to the room, um, the, the feedback they, they, that they gave was that, that sometimes people weren't closing out that loop by saying, okay, I'll see you next Thursday, or I'll see you next week, whatever it is. Um, in other words, somebody just placed the, the wheelchair there and then wandered off out of the room. Uh, and uh, that, that was quite a useful bit of feedback. Um, that uh, we've communicated to everybody that you know close that loop you pick them up you return to return them and then explain what's going to happen next because there's nothing more frustrating than thinking what next now what's going to happen you know just one little just one little uh, nugget there as it were mm, thank you darren any final words from you 
No. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Pleasure. Mike? No. Uh, well, thank you very much. Just looking forward to getting going, really. Great. Well, we're delighted to have you. Thank you. Well, then, thank you, everybody, for joining us. Emma, thank you for leading and facilitating that. Um, we'll record this, so it's up on the website. So if anyone else is interested in volunteering, send them to this link. Um, and uh, we will be back next week with our next lecture, which is on music therapy and neurodisability. So do join us again. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Anna. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. everyone. Thanks. Bye. Bye.